G'day. Today we're going on a trip along the Pennsylvania and Ohio Railroad mainline in trains SP3, a new era which has just been released. We'll be travelling between Abernathy and the current line N. We'll cover other branches in a future episode, so let's get into it. I would like to start by explaining the current state of the Pennsylvania and Ohio route. I am a member of the beta testing team for N3V's TRS 2019 new simulator version and, having seen the amazing transformation that has started, I have chosen not to add any more to the route that would be superseded by TRS 2019 when it arrives. If you keep up with the newsletter on TRS 2019, you will appreciate why the delay is well worth waiting for and I think it's not that far away either. So, while there's still much more trackage to add, plus buildings and infrastructure to compile, I'm still progressing with development of the route. It just stops when it reaches a particular level. So enjoy what is there. It should give you a reasonable understanding of what is coming. First, a brief introduction to the Pennsylvania and Ohio Railroad. The P&O has strong ties with the iconic Pennsylvania Railroad, known as America's Standard Railroad, even to the point they have an agreement that gives Pennsylvania Railroad access to P&O track, and most of the engines that P&O has are ex-Pennsylvania Railroad engines. The P&O has been much slower to dispense with the steamers so far. However, it has recently built a new diesel service facility in the main yard at Baldrock for its own SD9 and the Pennsylvania Railroad's visiting engines. P&O track starts near the city of Wheeling, West Virginia, but just across the border into Pennsylvania, and travels roughly west through coal country in the Appalachians, and then into Ohio, hence the name. The main line is around 10 miles in length, much is double track, but is less than half of the planned length. The branches are, firstly, the Banner branch, called that because it goes to the small town of Banner at the end of the line, where a narrow gauge logging line terminates at the town and in between services include a power facility, several towns and industries along the way. The second branch, called North Fork Turn, runs up steep mountainous country to a number of coal mines supported by the town of North Fork, owned and operated by the mining company, so there is much opportunity to generate traffic of various types within the P&O Territory, as well as from interchanges that exist with the Pennsylvania Railroad, Chesapeake and Ohio and Norfolk and Western. So let's have a quick look at some of the engine roster. The engine roster is mainly sourced from the Pennsylvania Railroad and includes the Penzi G5 10 wheeler. G5 is mainly used on peddler freights with some local passenger traffic and as an occasional helper on heavy grades, but only rarely. The Penzi E6 S Atlantic is not in regular use but is available for late extra passenger traffic and the Christmas train. Penzi 2100 Decapod. This is the workhorse of the coal traffic, which along with the Penzi M1B mountain is often double heading longer trains of loaded hopper cars, and it is limited to branches that have turning facilities, and is not great at running in reverse, and does not have efficient sanding when running in reverse. The famous Penzi K4 Pacific, used on mainline passenger trains almost exclusively, but they are prone to slippage in wet weather, which limits their hauling capacity so often it has a helper engine along to support it. The Penzi L1S Mikado is used on general freight traffic wherever needed and sometimes as a helper on the heavy graded North Fork turn. As the P&O is a bridge route in function, it does have many and varied train visits by other roads. This includes a number of other steamers and diesels from several other roads that are seen from time to time on P&O trackage. This includes the Pennsylvania Railroad itself, mainly with diesels, Norfolk and Western, who operate the massive articulated 2664 on trains that run over P&O trackage, Chesapeake and Ohio, which runs on P&O trackage from time to time, but only with the 284 Canawars, also known elsewhere as the Berkshire. However, the only diesel in P&O colours is the SD9, the newest workhorse on the P&O. With several GP9s on lease from Pennsylvania Railroad during peak periods, 
and also the Norfolk and Western SD9s are seen from time to time. The p does not own any named rolling stock and relies on the other lines that share its trackage. This is the starting point shown in the map earlier and is the fiddle yard at the main line start. You might notice there is not much here, just some track, ballast textures, terrain sculptures and that's it. Some places are a bit rough and ready, some have additional textures and some buildings in place. However, many smaller structures, telephone lines, fencing, fine detail, textures etc. are yet to be done. But as I said earlier, I can only advance so far until I can access the full features of TRS 2019 download station which I believe is not that far away. Then I will be recording each area that I finish as it is done and this will act as a tutorial and another opportunity for you to pick any areas I introduce. Just be gentle please. I also while recording a segment notice some minor track alignment errors which I have fixed. But if you see any serious errors, please let me know in the comments below this video. It will be much appreciated. Also, I think all the signals are working correctly, but I'm not so sure about the switch stands. What do you think? You may see some random smoke puffs. I think this is a bug in the physics of Tane SP3 that is yet to be fixed. With the recent trackage rights given to the Penzi by the P&O, this has become less useful and is used mainly for freight going to Hollow Lake, a city on the branch to the left. Through freight these days has the Penzi engine right through. Local freight for delivery before the Bald Rock Yard is still left here in this yard for the P&O to pick up and deliver. Local freight for Banner Branch or the North Fork Turn is left at the interchange in Bald Rock's yard. As the Pennsylvania Railroad is slowly retiring stream, the service facility of coal and water is only used by P&O and that's rare as both Hollow Lake and Bald Rock Yard have better facilities. Maybe sometimes the water tower is used. Although there is nothing there today, the main use of this yard has been for the work trains and its team of P&O workers. This has now been allocated as home yard for them. Now we're coming up to the Pensy Interchange Yard. You will note that there is a branch diverting to the left, right after the Penzi interchange yard. This leads to a comprehensive staging yard. More about this another time. Now, we head through some open country, with only a few small farms, yet to be added I might add, and you'll see the meatworks sometime before getting there. Once we arrive at the largest meatworks in the area, which can be seen in the distance already, it is the dominant structure in the area. With nearly 150 workers and several hundred head of cattle a week, this is the largest employer in the area and many of the workers are resident in the small village behind the plant, which generates traffic with cattle in using stock cars, meat products out using reefers, serviced and sent from Bald Rock Yard, as well as shipments for the village and company needs, often by boxcars. Indeed, a very busy site this one.
Heading past the meatworks complex, we start heading towards the hilly country and a change of scenery. Once through the tunnel, where the character of the area is getting more hilly as the train progresses, the country is also getting more rugged and challenging as we move further west. Then we approach one of the larger cattle ranches in the area with its own siding and an output of several hundred young cattle in the weaner season. They use a tractor to move the stock cars around and often receive a load of farm needs in a box car, which they unload at the small ramp next to the siding. While the ramp's not visible at the time of recording, it has been added in a subsequent edit. Note the ranch has substantial infrastructure buildings, as befits a large enterprise. We pass over a now unused cattle grid on the tracks. This is not used because of the substantial traffic increase in recent years. There have been too many times the farmer was caught out getting a herd across the track to another paddock, so it's been abandoned, and plans are afoot to build another way past the track. The solution? Well, all will be revealed in a coming video. As we leave the cattle ranch behind, the line starts running through a dense forest area. The country is getting rougher now. Then breaks into the open at the South Fork River with its twin girder bridges. Between the two bridges is a short siding, no longer connected, but no one seems to know what it was for. This was admittedly added after this video was recorded, but I thought I'd mention it, as I will be giving a special treatment later. The second set of girder bridges crosses the South Fork River yet again, before continuing on to the next tunnel. At this tunnel, there is a small community with an old wooden road bridge across the track. The small village has just enough facilities to support the population's residents. Once through the tunnel, a road parallels the track and crosses it. This road is the same one that just passed over the tracks before the tunnel. This time the forest has changed to predominantly pine trees. Well, that's my plan at this time. Crossing a road that leads to the town the other side of the tunnel, the forest again surrounds the track. Following the road, which has a minimal traffic, we soon come to the Bald Rock Yard. And we will remain on the main line with this large yard on both sides of the main. To the right you'll see is the reefer icing platform, which can handle up to 10 cars at a time. The ice plant that sources this ice is located behind the platform, but is yet to be installed. The main line has several entries and exits at this point to allow access without disruption to the mainline traffic when needed. The hills on the right are part of a national forest and have mature growth along most of the yard's right side. Entering Bald Rock's yard, which is nearly two miles in length and surrounded by mountains on the north side, is the town of Bald Rocks. Established over 200 years ago and with a population of over 15,000 people, many of whom work for the P&O Railroad, this being the headquarters of the P&O. The station is of modest proportions and has trains from Pennsylvania Railroad and Chesapeake and Ohio on regular timetables, with a weekly train travelling all the way back to New York, 
but sadly it's not one of the famous name trains and mainly runs because of traffic from other larger cities further west. In this yard, the main line exits and entries are signal, but off the main is called dark territory, that is, there are no signals. About halfway, on the left, is the substantial freight house, owned by the P&O. Also, the offices of the P&O, that services Bald Rocks and the surrounding area, is located upstairs. A little further along, on the right is the cattle yard, which provides cattle for the meatworks passed earlier, mainly from surrounding farms, as well as the holding yards, which are used to rest the cattle here if travel time on the rails for the cattle has expired, as off-car rest time is mandatory in this state. Here we see the CNO engine shed built purposely for the A-class articulated locomotives that are regular travellers on the division. And all minor service repairs can be undertaken here for the CNO engines. It's also capable of handling up to four of those Class A articulators, as well as any other Norfolk and Western engines from time to time. Further along on the right is the extensive engine service facility, still strongly oriented to steam needs, but with the first signs of dieselisation that is coming, with a new fuel and service facility next to the older steam structures. Because the turntable is not large enough for the CNO A-class articulators, a Y has been constructed on the left-hand side opposite the service area. There are many other buildings and services yet to be added to the yard precinct, which ensures this is the primary traffic generator on this division. As yet, I have not finalised exactly what, or where, and undoubtedly there will be additional sidings added before the yard is finished. And is also where the original work train storage sidings were located. They are now used as rip tracks, with the work train facilities being located further east along the Hollow Lake branch. Just beyond the western end of the yard is the first coal tipple, known as Banner Tipple No. 1 which now is a shadow of its former glory, but still in production for steaming coal, several cars a day doing the short trip to the yard coaling tower, which is a similar story to the Norfolk and Western, which is still running a fleet of articulated engines for coal hauling in its own territory, with coal being so accessible. This is where the banner branch diverts to the right, A short and eventful trip along the main finally sees a point of interest coming up on the left. And that is where we see the small yard. This is where the coal train empties arrive and the loads coming onto the main line from the two large mine tipples on the North Fork turn both generating several full trains a day. The North Fork Turn has some of the steepest grades in the Territory, peaking at nearly 2% at times. Double and triple heading is often required when the weather is unkind, and the Chesapeake and Ohio A-Class is often called upon during the harsh winters to help with keeping coal loads moving when delays have seen no shipments for days at a time up the North Fork Turn. At this yard, there are just a couple of tracks to hold empties whereas the loaded cars go straight through to the Bald Rocks yard, plus a siding for the scheduled helper engine that pushes up the hill when required. The yard also still has a water tower, just in case water may be needed, as well as a small hut or two to fulfil a variety of needs. None of these items are yet installed. Moving further west, we travel over one of the twin bridges that gets the main line across the North Fork River. The main line was originally a single track, but with traffic during World War II, it became necessary to duplicate the main, with a second bridge being built, which explains why the two bridges are somewhat further apart. Due to poor foundation substrata close to the older bridge, both bridges were replaced with similar material being used, but during construction, one bridge was always required to be in service to support the war effort, so they were placed a little further apart than normal.
After crossing the bridge, travelling further west and towards a truss girder bridge, we pass over the Banner Branch, as mentioned earlier, and come to the current end of the main, some 11 miles from our journey start, and with plans already drawn up to extend the main another 20 plus miles. I developed this introduction to the Pennsylvania and Ohio to tell the story about why the railroad exists, something that is always important, particularly if not based on a specific prototype. And although the route still has a long way to go before being finished, I have purposely held back developing it further to ensure, when it is released, that it is in a trains version that will be the standard for many years to come. You'll notice here that the detail is almost complete, at least as far as we can go with Tain SP3. As you can see here, we are using Tain procedural track and there is no detailed vegetation on the ground, apart from the trees. And until TRS 2019 is ready, I can't really go any further. So you can see here we have a partly finished scene. The main items missing are the ground cover such as grass, the small shrubs, the more advanced procedural track in TRS 2019 and more. So now let's move up to that tunnel ahead and see what's on the other side. Whoops, we have broken out into a very raw scene, with just the track, some basic textures on the ground, some hills and valleys, an unfinished tunnel portal ahead, and that's about it. That's what I mean about being an unfinished route at this time. And I believe TRS 2019 can be that vehicle. I just don't know the exact date when I continue adding more detailed scene. I will say, until the route is complete, and using as many of the TRS 2019 enhancements as possible, the release of this route for trains enthusiasts will only happen when those goals have been met to my satisfaction. If I was to guess, given there are also the need for a number of sessions to be developed, Signalling to fine tune, artificial intelligence trains, support implemented, something I don't currently know how to do. I would guess it will not happen until early 2019 or even later. I hope this insight will give you the incentive to follow along as I build not only more trackage, but I can start to upgrade the scenery, the buildings, details, industries, and infrastructure. Here is a quick scan of the roster of locomotives that already have the Pennsylvania, Ohio name and logo. and also includes the Pennsylvania Railroad engines that appear here from time to time. These have been done by two main trains developers with every intention they will be available to anybody who wants to use them with the Pennsylvania and Ohio route, which I will continue to update and showcase here on Collins Trains until it is released. I will soon be doing a similar but maybe shorter video on both the North Fort Turn, seen here, and the Banner Branch, as well as the City of Hollow Lake and its Industries and Coal Mine Branch. I'll also cover many other smaller areas under development now and in the future, including my first trains tutorial covering basic track laying and signalling, which has already been uploaded. So watch this space as the Pennsylvania and Ohio grows up, and if you have any comments, or would like to let me know of any glaring errors or just have something to say, please tell me in the comments below this video. I always read each and every one and respond if needed. And if you want to get noticed when each episode is uploaded to YouTube, I recommend you subscribe using the link below this video. And don't forget to ring the bell on the right side of the subscribe button as that ensures you receive a notice for each new episode. And I will add this has been a long video and although I have adjusted the video speed in places to limit it, I appreciate your lasting distance. I hope you found this tutorial enjoyable and of benefit. If you have any thoughts to share, please add a comment below the video. I always check the comments and appreciate every one of them. But now, that's it from me. Hooroo!